Let's have this one. Good morning, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to beautiful Denver, Colorado. We're here at MOI, is making our way midway through day one. My name is Savannah Peterson here, joined with John Furrier on, we were just talking, yeah. it's like the coolest time to be in tech. It's cool, and it's cold. It's you got the jacket on, you got the AC <laughs> cranked up here. Uh, this is one of my favorite events, I say this all the time, because it's a very intimate, it's very high end, um, it's the front lines, it's the alpha engineers, we're solving with the hardest problems. And as yep, customers need to implement, implement and operationalize Gen AI, which is right, happening in real time, they're navigating these new technologies, but they don't want to compromise their security posture. So you have a lot of things going on here and a lot of smart people working on all these hard problems. So it's great. Our next guest is going to give us the Google perspective. So I'm super psyched. Me too. Yeah, speaking of smart people and baller skiers, Taylor, awesome. thank you so much for taking time this morning. Awesome to be here. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> uh, it was fun getting to a reminisce about skiing before we jumped on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Denver is one of the cities you were willing to come to conferences because of this. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> I prefer if it's January to April. But yeah. uh, no, Denver is cool. It's great to be down here. It's a really cool event. We've had a nice venue. Here. Yeah, we're gonna have fun this week. So we are gonna have yeah, fun. Yeah. We're gonna teach you some interesting stuff. You're you're in the office of the CSO. What is what is? I'm just curious. We're gonna dig in and and really let you talk about some exciting stuff. But what is your job like? I mean, you mentioned you wear a lot of different hats. You do a lot of different things. What's a day in the life? I mean, I think it's different for everybody in my group. Uh, it's tough to tough to say exactly. Uh, you know, we are. A group of former security executives and um, leaders of teams from all different industries and geos. Um, I think we're up roughly, um, I, I want to say, uh, six to seven critical infrastructure industries and in 10 different countries we have folks with expertise yeah. and we cover risk, compliance, privacy, security, basically the whole gamut of what a CISO at a customer of ours might run into. We, partner with our customers to help, really the way I describe it is to help them take full advantage of doing business with Google. Yeah. Not just squeezing every bit of security value out of the cloud, but uh, really like we do so much in so many different areas, whether it be open source, cloud, new technology. Um, you know, We try to make sure that that's available in front of people so when they make the best yeah. decisions they need to make. Yeah. We also do a lot of advisory work, so I spend a lot of time with CISOs, coaching teams. Yeah. I spend time with boards, coaching boards. Um, I, you know, we, I just launched a product, uh, <laughs> shameless plug. We just, uh, Office of the CISO launched a product at the, the Google Next conference this spring called Isolator, which uh, brings together a bunch of different Google technologies to create um, isolated environments for collaboration. So we do a lot of different things, but okay. we're, we're here mainly to support customers uh, coming and taking advantage yeah. of the security features of the platform. Taylor, you mentioned before we came on that the number one question you get is, do you use your own products that you sell, that like Google sells? Uh, and Google, at scale, is just massive. Um, the cyber landscape is global, it's scalable too, it's large scale. Yeah. Kevin goes in his keynote, it always talks about national security, cyber warfare, offense and defense, and all that other things that he, questions he gets. But to make Google secure, your customers are having that same challenge too. So how do you balance the innovation? I mean, as a practitioner inside Google at scale, you know, how, how do you look at that balance while fostering the innovation, while maintaining the robust security? Because you guys have really strong security at Google. Yeah, I mean, I, we were talking earlier. I, I think the, for me, and this is my opinion, uh, I think the coolest thing about Google security is the fact that um, we use the things that we provide to customers. Um, All in our of you playing right. with it. Um, and that's just more than like a cool, neat fact. The reality of what it takes to do that is, you know, if you want to build anything that's going to secure well and at scale, the ultimate testing ground is Google and the 130 or so thousand engineers and people yeah. here who are going to test your thing to, to tell you if it works or not and works well or not before it ever touches a customer. So right away you've got you know, some brilliant minds, people looking for, you know, problems, that's their job, you know, hacking things, taking it down to smaller pieces and building it back up. And that's already, that goes into the, the ideas. And then when you, we take something and run it at a global scale, you test to see that it can actually meet the needs of, you know, tremendous volumes that might be thrown at it. And th after that is when it gets put in front of customers. And that, and that loop 
always goes. It's all the time. And you're properly your own worst critic. I can you're imagine. Always, that. absolutely. Yeah. We, are yeah. the, we are the toughest on ourselves as possible. Yeah. And I, I think that extends to all the security products, all of our products, really. Um, not just the security ones. I, I think I think smart CISOs get this. And and I was saying like the best question I get is, um, do you use your own stuff? Yeah. Because I, I mean, when I was a CISO and I was a CISO of a big uh, health tech company, I don't think I ever asked anybody that question. But now, yeah, I, it's the first question out of my mouth. Yeah, and you guys have the need. You guys have the need. Story. Well, yeah. one of the questions that Kevin uh, Mendy said on his keynote was, well, he gets a question: um, What's what CEOs wish they knew before the breach? Kind of like in a post mortem. Oh, and he, and his answer was interesting. I want to yeah. get your reaction to it. Red teaming and tabletop exercise, obviously he's big on tabletop. Um, and he said, practice purchasing red lever events. So two questions, react to that, and then what is a red lever, lever event? I mean, you got me on a red lever. Red lever? A lever. Uh, uh, wow, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to make something up. Uh, that's okay. That's going to, Kevin's going to. Hey, I'll have to ask him that tomorrow when he comes on the queue. Uh, look, I think, um, uh, look, big incidents and breaches, it's, uh, it's usually obvious what didn't happen or should have in hindsight. Yeah. And I think taking proactive security steps like red teaming, like tabletops, stress testing, scenario analysis, yeah. there's a variety of things you can do both technically as well as from your desk that will alert you to where your biggest challenges are. I think that's stuff we should be doing all the time anyway. Things like continuous controls monitoring, also another one I'd throw in there. But I think you know Kevin's perspective and experience comes is yeah. very well informed from having worked on some of the biggest, gnarliest things out there. Right. And so I mean, I would yeah. I would totally agree with with his piece. But yeah. it's not the whole story, right? Yeah. It's it's we need to not only test to see where our weaknesses are, but we also need to test to make sure that we have confidence in the defenses and that they're working. Yeah. Right, and that's a, a slightly different view. And there's other types of analysis yeah. and, and assessment. He, he, he mentioned we, we need to do both. He, he what's mentioned and what's not. He mentioned was on that comment resilience under stress. You mentioned stress testing yeah. and simulations. How how any attack? How, 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 how what tools and what techniques do you do that? How do you do that? Like what's your philosophy mindset? And then how do you kind of roll that out? I spend oh man. All right. Well, uh, resilience is a measurement problem. <laughs> it's not a technology issue. Uh, it's a, do you understand what you have, what it's dependent on, who's working on it, and what the different, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, pressures are placed on it, whether it be uh, an adversary as something that you want, uh, a nation state, uh, if within that category, you've got governments that have different views, views and perspectives on how things should work. You've got businesses uh, that have expectations of you, expressed normally through contracts. You have all these pressures and uh, being resilient is being able to understand what are all of these requirements as well as things that could go wrong and proactively planning for um, what you're going to do when those things occur. And so uh, when I say it's a measurement problem, it actually is a yeah. measurement problem. Um, it's how well do you know yeah. your environment? How well do you know what you have? Do you, how well do you know why it matters to someone else? Uh, yeah. to know how distributed it is, how ephemeral it is, and, and, and really building, and, and really about your teams and how they work. Um, it's a humongous topic, and I, we actually spend a lot more time talking about it now, especially I work in healthcare, and resilience is our number one uh, area of focus right now, but um, it is nice to see the, the shift moving less about, hey, we need to lock data down yeah. and make it inaccessible, to being, hey, we need to anticipate that that's going to happen. How are we going to keep our business running? And, and like, when it does. And that, that's, I think, the right shift. No, the qu my final question, I'll let Savannah jump yeah. in. He also said he doesn't get what questions he doesn't get. And what he doesn't get is cyber resilience because it's become part of the nomenclature of most CISOs. That's back in recovery. How do you, how do you come back from a yeah. breach? So the question for you is, what questions don't you get now that, that have become a nomenclature and or operational practices inside the enterprise? So what, what questions do I not get? Not that get, that, that you I used to get. used to get or that you expect to get that are already entrenched in the mindset of the customer? You know, it's, um, it's interesting. I feel like I, I don't get, but I should be getting a way more questions about application security, um, mm. be, being the fact that uh, we have this new thing called generative AI, which isn't actually that new. It's been around for a long time. Um, and yeah, we're trying to discover how to secure it properly. And, and I say, guess what guys, like it's, almost the same problem that you were trying to solve before it showed up, and it was just called application security and supply chain security. <laughs> right. And now it's yeah. just got a new, fancier, flashier name on it, but like, we, we should be talking about that more than we are, right? Um, we should be talking about um, improving uh, risk quantification and risk communication. So uh, we need to be more advanced ways of identifying risk as well as communicating risk. And I see 
there's pockets of groups who are good at one and not the other. We need to get better at both. And so I want to talk to people about how to do that. Uh, resilience, obviously a huge one. And that's a little bit of a challenging topic because everyone's need for what that means is different. And so there's no general framework that one can apply and say, if you do this, you're resilient. So those are really interesting conversations that I'm having yeah. more of, but we need to have yeah. many awesome. more of them, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally like makes sense. Yeah. to the philosophy of, of what defines it's, it's complex. Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. Complicated. Yeah, no, it is, and, well, and, and, and it's complex. And speaking of that complexity, you just listed a lot of different things that you're thinking about. Sorry about that. No, 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 no it's right awesome, way. yeah. No, this, this, is a, this is a good thing. I'm, okay. I'm building on that. Don't, don't worry, you can't scare us with your complexity. We're here before <laughs> I promise. But I'm, I'm really curious how you manage to handle that tension within the org of what do we build or solve for first versus the needs of some of your customers versus Google's needs. Yeah. I mean, the prioritization there in itself must be a challenge. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge, fortunately, that I um, get to see play out and not have to be in the decision-making process. But look, like... <laughs> so you're never in trouble. I don't know. I mean, I've had moments where I've, <laughs> in prior roles at Google, I've, I've been in that, those decision-making seats. I'm not right now. I will say... Um, I think the, uh, I, I think, I, I think we never get this wrong, no matter what. We never get this wrong where, when we put the customer's needs first, because that is the thing that pulls through everything else that we do at Google that matters most, because if it's not oriented in, and it's not, I'm not talking about commercial outcomes or yeah. what's going to drive the sale. I'm talking about what's going to get the outcome of a better, yeah. more secure, reliable system, process, people, team, whatever that is. And that be the thing that we internally all yeah. orient around and put as the number one reason why we do anything. And it's the place where we get our requirements from. It's the place where we test and validate our ideas. Yeah. And as long as we're starting there, no, all of those other things, protecting yeah. Google, all the place. because we dog food. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What's right for customers is right for us. Yeah. What's right for us is right for customers. So right. it's, it's always, it's always working backwards from what does that audience need and yeah. then letting that guide you to the right answer. And it works. I think, you're, I think your angle on application security is right on because Gen AI is part of the app totally now. Agree. Agentic systems are coming with Gen AI. You're seeing that now. So, and, and you mentioned I mean, that. differences, but well, generally speaking. We can, we, can, yeah. well, we can unpack that, but the question for you is that are third party now is a big part because apps are talking to each other. Yeah. So you have APIs right. running things. You've got data, data crossing over yeah. potentially. How should organizations assess um, their applications with Gen AI and or applications. When on you have all the APIs, which is now becoming plumbing, I think yeah. it away. So you got the scale of API connections. Yeah. That's a third party connector, basically. So you're in a rather genius environment. You got to manage third parties. How should companies, and how do you think about uh -huh. assessing that? I mean, if I knew the answer to this, I, right. I would be a wealthy person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, uh, <laughs> look like, so we can, <laughs> we'll, we'll join you. <laughs> when you, when you come, when we start that company. <laughs> we'll we'll found it right here. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. yeah. I'm sure Sundar is going to be thrilled with that, or Thomas. Um, <laughs> I think the, uh, I, I mm. so I'm going to, frame your question a yeah. little bit differently. Cool. And it's, what should we be doing about things that we are very dependent on, right? In, in ways that we probably didn't think we would ever be, but now yeah. are. And those, the things that we're dependent on are growing in size and in the options that are out there, right? APIs is an example, yeah. right? Um, it's, I think the thing we need to do about it is stop doing the things we're currently doing about it, which is, um, like arm's length assessments of how these service providers or services are built, provided, shipped, run, maintained, yeah. whatever, and, and stop necessarily taking uh, somebody's word for whether, A, it's secure or not, because I say so. And yeah. organizations really digging in and demanding more visibility and transparency into not just yeah. like, um, you know, the, whether the product does the thing that it's supposed to do or whether yeah. the API product, but like, we need secure products. They need to be secure. Uh, don't tell me what your security products are. Yeah. I expect them to be secure. So I want all of the services that are being put out that I'm consuming to be secure by design. And I need to mandate that yeah. in my procurement cycles and I need to enforce that yeah. when I adopt something and I need to make sure that's true all the time. As opposed to what I think happens today, and I'm not throwing shade at anybody, yeah. but because this problem is so big, yeah. the industry has resorted to sending out questionnaires to vendors and trying to do arms-length assessments and remote audits of things. And that's, you know, it, 
for some for some arrangements that's probably good enough. But when you've got mission critical systems yeah. that are dependent on systems that might not be thought of as mission critical, and you create these really important dependencies between systems that you have no ability to validate they're gonna work in those yeah. bad situations, right. then you got a problem. That brings up some that you're pointing out. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta go yeah. deeper. I mean you mentioned supply chain earlier. This is kind of a holistic supply chain it's 100 percent kind of yeah. kind of observability. Yeah, yes. Data lineage meets data explainability. Yep. I mean, this seems to be the hot area right now. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, in so many ways, right? Like, supply chain security touches everything, and it's not just software, right? It's like, it's the hardware, which we spend almost no time talking about. You asked yeah. me about what should we be talking about more. I can't even, like, I would love to talk about hardware security yeah. and the dependencies we have on that, but people's minds would blow. Yes, and then I'd lose them and I'd never you know, have another conversation about security again. But I would like, love to have that yeah, conversation. Yeah. We're going to have that conversation. Yeah. Um, the yeah. silicon itself, I yeah. mean, there's so much hardware um, security that matters that yeah. uh, upon which the software uses, if done correctly, to create a root of trust that allows you to trust the machine. Yeah, and it's yes. extremely complicated and very important. But, um, yes. you know, I think like, uh, look, supply chain is a is an interesting, it's a it's a it's an interesting thing. At Google, we talk a lot about in terms of open source, yeah, right, and we talk about it in terms of build and testing systems and deployment systems, and that's a really important part about supply chain. But we need to start looking at not just the software, but the services. Yeah. How important they are to us? Do we need more than one? Yeah. Right. Right? Do we need three? Do we need four? What are we dependent on? What do, we, what do they really need from us? Or is that something that we can insource as opposed to outsource? Like, there's a lot of questions that we need to get into to like really understand, and then what controls we need to, to address the supply chain. I think Google's done an awesome job, at least being a leader in this space with things like Salsa, yeah, yeah. And Guac, yeah. and open sourcing yeah. a lot of the build systems and tools that we use at Google, like uh, uh, Bazel and others. Um, you can read about them in our open source. Um, and I, honestly, all the cool yeah. stuff we do in, in yeah. customers' hands some way or another. I, I think this is one area, but I do think we're going to be talking about supply chain security for a long time. And I, and, and I do, I like the direction, the secure by design, the SISA pledge and yeah. Google yeah. support, yeah. as well as the other tech providers too. Yeah. Totally. Um, getting behind it, it's, 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 it's good, but we're going to be early days. We're gonna be working on this for a while. So. <laughs> we're going to be working on it for a while, and I actually want to tie that to a conversation we were having before we went live. We're, we're going to need more people than ever to solve these problems. It's not just the same silos of, of security professionals. We were talking about, because of Google's scale and swath, the democratization of security and the ability for it to be in, in multiple languages and multiple regions and for solutions to come from a lot of different yeah. teams and people around the world. Yeah, I mean, I think we talk about the cyber talent gap. I'd say it's... Uh, on one hand, you could say, yes, there are not enough people with the right skills necessary to take on some of these challenges. Another could say, we have enough people, we just don't have the right ways to engage them and find them and train them. I think we need to work on both of those things and we need to make cyber accessible to them. Earlier, like before we were on, we were talking about like our ability to not transcribe and translate into so many different languages. You might take that for granted, but that's actually a pretty amazing thing. And yeah. it's relatively new at scale at real time. Oh, totally, yeah. yeah. I mean. It, just being able to communicate more effectively is a great thing, but being able to uh, do so on increasingly technical yeah. topics where precision is critical and you can't get a single word wrong, um, but being able to do that confidently. Uh, yeah, I mean, all these things add up to be more capable, yeah, yeah. better organized, better communicating. I mean, these are all the things that, that we, need, we need security to become. And, and, and yeah, I think, I think training and staff and people development are key to all of that. Yeah, that brings up the whole, the old adage, you're hurting the cats. Uh, how do you communicate to your organization and across stakeholders? And as you advise customers, people have to work together. It's a big theme of the conference uh, this year is here is you know, really bridging the gap between groups and technologies, um, frameworks are now uh, front and center. Yeah. Talk about that whole, I won't say mo movement of kind of a nexus of people, technology and frameworks policy. It's really complicated in the sense of this three different things kind of coming together. Um, as a leader, you know, one of the things I'm sure you must deal with this a lot, what's your, what's your current situation and how would you advise folks who are trying to navigate that? I mean, I, I, I say if I'm a CISO of one company, as opposed to uh, a, a director at Google looking after and supporting many, my answer changes. Um, but if I'm a CISO of a company and I'm trying to thread the needle of who do I need to involve, what do I need to say, how do I coordinate and work with those people, and how do I translate it in a way that there's going to understand yeah. and compel action? Uh, I've been, uh, I've said this before, like empathy is the is a great CISO's yeah. superest power. Um, yeah. 
saying and actually investing the time into getting to know the people you're working with, understand how decisions get made, understand the role that data plays, stories, anecdotes, et cetera, but it's learning how to communicate yeah. by interacting with the people you want to communicate. I know this sounds super basic. Yeah. It's, it's not. It's super basic, but it's like something that groups don't do enough of. And the decision making is accelerated and also optimized yeah. uh, that way. And you also have a diversity of thought in that room 100%. versus just the loudest yeah. person yeah. who is always. It's, they, I, every problem is made easier to solve if you can recruit people to care about it and frame it in terms that they understand and contribute to. Yeah. And I'd say like, I know, Absolutely. I think overall, every cyber strategy succeeds or fails on this point. Um, every great CISO becomes a greater CISO or not as great CISO based on their ability to deliver on this. And, and it starts with them, as no one else is going to do it for them. And that's the other realization is really leaning in. Now, when it's somebody like me, hey, I'm trying to look at the trends of how this is going. I see a pockets of amazing communication and amazing empathy at the senior leadership levels. Um, I don't always see it being returned. And so we need to do a little bit more on yeah, close that loop. and supporting the other side of that conversation with what they need to do to show up and help, be able to help the CISO. And so a lot of what we're doing in Office of the CISO right now through our CISO insights, our CAB, our board uh, presentations, our community forums are not just geared towards how do we help the CISO be more effective a communicator about risk, but it's also bringing in uh, expertise from the outside to help us train the other side to be more receptive to what needs to happen. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing. And we actually, we had a paper on this. It's probably going to be coming out later this year, but like, you know, a guide for board, um, okay. really like how to, how to, how to support and engage your CISO. Well, huge. I think it's so relevant. Too. Yeah, huge. Yeah. It's not obvious. That's no, it's sure. not obvious. And you know, it, we're all nerds. I say that with love, not throwing you in a bucket, but we all love products, <laughs> we all love tech, we all love details. But, but you, you brought up such a critical, actually we're having this conversation all day between user experience and also communication. That's at the crux of any security. If there's no communication or ineffective communication, something's going to fall through the Swiss cheese. So, all right, I have one last question for you because this has been such an exciting dialogue. We've actually already gone over time, but you're thrilling, so I don't care. What's the most overhyped thing in security right now? Oh. <laughs> the cute one. Oh. Or oh, shiny new, shiny new toy. The uh, <laughs> overhyped, <laughs> under delivering. I like this. He's, he's chewing on this. This is good. I can't wait to hear what he he's says. He's processing. Uh, CISO automation platforms. Ooh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think these are hilarious. Um, these are platforms that seek to replace the CISO with a questionnaire that can be self-managed and self-steered by yeah, yeah. a technical enough person, but someone with no real depth of understanding yeah. or training, awareness. And I'm not saying stupid, because these are often not that stupid. These are uh, mechanisms, old just, mechanisms. You know, um, they're trying to, trying to um, look, the, the, we talked about it in this interview. Being great at this requires strong communication skills, the ability to empathize, the ability to understand and translate technology to many different audiences and many different languages, the ability to look around corners and anticipate what's next, That's right. the ability to look at a new problem and apply Shut up. Shut up. old techniques yeah. to solve it, right? These are all different skills. And I, I just find it funny that yeah. we've, you know, and there's so many things that we need to solve for that are so much more important than this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the other side of this is there's so many, like we need to solve application security. Yeah, we need yeah. to solve yeah. Yeah. Yeah, security. We need to get secure by design everywhere, right? These are problems that we need to solve. Automating the security leader is not one of them. We could do a whole segment on an AppSec review process. Uh, I yeah. mean, don't even go there right now. Well, I think, I mean, yeah. Well, I think we could have about 18 different conversations with Taylor based on this initial dialogue. I mean, I got more. That was just yeah. like the one that's like, what is the most ridiculous thing I've taken a demo of? I think, I think you're absolutely right. And it, it also hits on what I think is getting overinflated across the AI market, which is this notion that an agent's going to take over human behavior at its entirety and eliminate critical thinking, which is... You're, you're I mean, I know that's the answer that people wanted me to say was AI or AI security I, related, but yeah. No, but I actually like what you're, where you took it. I, I, none of those things change and they never will change in being important, yeah. right? Yeah, like yeah. tech is going to come and go. We're going to see these changes. We're going to adapt to them. And we're going to, the ones who can do those things well yeah. are going to be the ones that take advantage of the, the opportunity that they yeah. have as opposed to the ones reacting or falling behind. Um, no. But yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting set of things. I do think though, uh, if you were to ask that question differently, I think there are definitely problems that are more important for us to solve now than later. And I, and I, I definitely think 
open source security at scale globally on the most important projects is absolutely critical. I think solving for deep fakes and all of these interesting authentication yes, problems yes, yes, yes. that we're going to be having soon is critically important, only to be made worse by yeah. uh, um, quantum computing, um, which you know the, a lot of encryption is being used as uh, mechanisms for authentication. Uh, and so these two things are going to bleed over and now we're going to have massive issues on one side that are going to bleed into uh, yeah. issues on the other side. And then, of course, you know, taking AI responsibly and carefully, fairly using yeah. it in appropriate ways, um, I think is obviously critically important for businesses that are looking to do good in the world, but we've also got to develop robust mechanisms to detect when yeah. there are people who are not building the right stuff um, and, and, and have appropriate measures and safeguards against those things too. So yeah. uh, defending against AI uh, and, and, and understanding that there will be adversarial use, probably you know more so than there would be productive use of it, mm -hmm. and planning for that future now is, I think, in areas that I'd like to see us do more in. And like Google is doing stuff in all of these things. So awesome. I feel for me, it feels pretty awesome to be able to see it um, and talk to those engineers and hopefully not annoy them and <laughs> yeah. well, get, them, share it. get them to invite me to their meetings more uh, <laughs> so I can sit on the fly on the wall and have an opinion on this stuff. But hey, well, appreciate uh, you sharing. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, Taylor, you really covered a lot of different bases, supply chain, communication, democratizing security. I'm here for uh, all of it. Yeah. This was a fun one. To yeah, great, yeah. All right. Thank you all for tuning in to our fabulous two days of coverage here in Denver, Colorado at MWISE. We're going to keep, keep, te keep teaching you all of the cool things from the smartest experts in security. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news.